Hi friends, it's a gift to be back with you today. As we hear from Matthew 10, verses 24 through 39, I will be reading today from the Inclusive Bible. A student is not superior to the teacher. The follower is not above the leader. The student should be glad simply to become like the teacher, the follower like the leader. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of the household? Don't let people intimidate you. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed and nothing is hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in darkness, speak in the light. What you hear in private, proclaim from the housetops. Don't fear those who can deprive the body of life but can't destroy the soul. Rather, fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Are not the sparrows sold for pennies? Yet not a single sparrow falls to the ground without your Abba God's knowledge. As for you, every hair on your head has been counted. So don't be afraid of anything. You are worth more than an entire flock of sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before Abba God in heaven. Whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before Abba God in heaven. Don't suppose that I came to bring peace on earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. I have come to turn a son against his father, a daughter against her mother, in-law against in-law. One's enemies will be the members of one's own household. Those who love mother or father, daughter or son more than me are not worthy of me. Those who will not carry with them the instrument of their own death, following in my footsteps, are not worthy of me. You who have found your life will lose it. And you who lose your life for my sake will find it. On Monday, June 1st, one week after George Floyd, a black man, was extrajudiciously executed, and by that I mean lynched, by a white police officer, while three other police officers stood by and watched. The President of the United States of America, after having the police tear gas and shoot rubber bullets at peaceful protesters to clear them out of the way, stood in front of the church sign at St. John's Parish, held up a Bible as if brandishing a weapon, and all but authorized the use of military force against American citizens. As a Christian, as a United Church of Christ minister, as a mother to three little white boys, and as an American, I'm appalled by this behavior. I'm horrified at the words that were spoken and by the violence that was condoned. And I have the eyes to see the direct link between statements like these and the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so, so many, far too many other black and brown people who are killed at the hands of the state or at the hands of white folk with the freedom to murder black folk as the result of white supremacy that was at its inception and remains even now woven into the fabric of our nation. And yet, this very book that the president waved around like a spoil of war speaks a harsh truth for these days. In the Gospel of Matthew, as we just heard, Jesus says, listen, <laughs> if you're going to follow me, you're going to need to be expect, you are going to need to expect to be treated like me. Those who oppose me call me Beelzebub. They call me the devil. Don't be surprised when they call you a devil too. Jesus said, it's tempting to be afraid of those with power. They can kill us. But God is in the details. And in life and in death, we belong to God. So Jesus says, don't think that I've come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. 
blood actually isn't thicker than water, Jesus says, because the measure of welcome that God cares about isn't who's married to whom or what name or lineage you come from, but rather it's about who gives a cup of cold water to those who are thirsty and who is willing to pick up their cross and carry it to lay down one's life for their friends. Jesus says that it's about being willing to live and more importantly, even being willing to die so that every single person on this earth knows that they are loved and that they are worthy and that they belong. And his letter to the church at Ephesus, the apostle Paul powerfully called the faithful to stand firm in the face of those with riot gear. And Paul challenged the faithful to clothe themselves with the armor of God. Paul writes, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against rulers and against authorities and against cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, Paul says, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done so, that you might be able to stand firm. Paul says, stand tall and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This militaristic language and imagery is something that I've rejected for a long time. I think for the most part, I feared that using the languages and the images of those intent on destruction would make the rest of us, the rest of us who really do want peace, who really do want justice, that it would make us indistinguishable from, from them. That if we're using the same language and we're, if we're using the same images and if we're talking about the same tools, how can we be sure we're not fighting the same war? But circling back to Matthew's gospel, I'm mindful that Jesus wasn't above this imagery. Jesus rejected some saccharine message of peace, which often just means the absence of disturbance, when what is really needed, what Jesus really proclaimed, what God actually calls us to is justice and equity, both of which necessitate disturbing the status quo and upsetting an apple cart or two. It looks like flipping tables in the temple. And Jesus wasn't above that. So in these tumultuous and transformative and holy days, I'm thinking about what it means to armor up. Not with riot gear, not with rubber bullets, not with mace, not with tear gas, not with guns or rocks, but to armor up, as Paul says, with truth and righteousness, with peace and faith, with salvation and the spirit. And to add to our armor, as Jesus called us to, our crosses and cups of water for those who are thirsty. That this is what it looks like to do the faithful work of standing firm against the present darkness. That in order to follow Christ, we must be willing to lose our lives, or at the very least, our power and our privilege and our supremacy and our wealth for Jesus' sake. I think we have it in us. And if not, I pray that we will. Thanks be to God. Amen.